This is going to be Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to look at the church at Ephesus. And Ephesus means fully purposed. Paul also wrote to Ephesus himself. But here John is writing to Ephesus. And you can go back and read where Paul wrote to the epistle to the Ephesians. The Bible is written in such a way that any person from any age can pick it up and it will be up to date for their day and age that they're living in. The Bible has more than one application as you'll see. And these churches in Revelation chapter 4 can apply to a church that was around in John's day. They can also apply to us today in a devotional sense. Then they can apply to future churches in the time of Jacob's trouble. So it has at least three applications. And a fourth application would be that each church represents a different phase of church history. In Revelation 2 and verse 1, it says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. First we see that this is written to the angel of the church. And it seems like the things down here on earth have a representation in heaven. We also have an angel representing us in heaven. This is seen in verses like Acts 12.15 when Peter escaped from prison. They thought that Peter was really just P Peter's angel. They didn't think it was really him. Hebrews 13.2 talks about entertaining angels unaware. They look so much like a man that you couldn't tell them apart from a regular man. Matthew 18.10 seems to hint at guardian angels. It says, Take heed that ye desire not one of the... Not... Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So it seems that for things down here, there is a representation of it up in heaven. Even for churches and nations. For example, Michael would represent Israel. Daniel 12.1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. So the angel of the church of Ephesus would be an angel representing that church in heaven. And the church doesn't mean a building. And the Bible refers to it as a congregation of people or the church which is his body. The church is made up of all born again believers. So you have churches that are congregations of people or the church which is the body of Christ made up of all born again believers. And you can read about this in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Jesus Christ doesn't have a whole bunch of little bodies everywhere. He has one body, and that's the church made up of all born-again believers. You can't deny that with Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So a church can be a group of believers who are in a building somewhere, or not even in a building, just out in the woods somewhere. But the church is all born-again believers, which makes up the body of Christ. To say there is no church made up of all born again believers is not being faithful to the mysteries of God because that's one of the mysteries. Revelation 2 1 It says, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The one holding the seven stars in his right hand is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The seven stars are the angels. Of the seven churches as it says in Revelation 1.20. So Jesus Christ can hold these angels in his hand. And he also holds believers in his hand. If you look at John 10.28-30 through 30, it says. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. And in this age we are in, we are put into the body of Christ. We aren't just in his hand. We 
make up his hand. We are a part of the body of Christ. This is proof for once saved, always saved, because if we could lose salvation, then Jesus Christ would have to amputate part of his body. Revelation 2, 1 says, He walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. Now moving on to verse 2, we're going to look at these verses and see how they apply to us, while we also see how they apply to saints in the coming tribulation time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. As you know, we are saved and raptured out before the tribulation begins. Revelation 2, 2 through 3 says, And I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. First we see this is a church that worked and labored for the Lord without fainting. Even though we aren't saved by works, as the Bible says in Romans 4, 5, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Titus 3, 5, we should still add works to our faith. We don't do this to stay saved or to earn salvation in any way, but the Bible definitely teaches to work for the Lord after salvation. Ephesians 2, 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Christians shouldn't be lazy. We should do things that will earn ourselves rewards in heaven. We should be doing things for other people. Our labor is not in vain in the Lord. We should be laboring in the word and doctrine. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we should be workmen who labor in the word and doctrine. This is done when we study the words of God and even teach it to others. It can be hard to study. It can be hard to work and labor in the word without fainting because Ecclesiastes 12.12 12 says, and further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. Proverbs 24.10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. All of this work and labor we do as Christians is not to maintain our salvation. We do it because we love the Lord and want to please Him. All the things are mentioned for us to follow in the Pauline epistles, all of these things. It says in 1 Thessalonians 1.3, Remember without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Approaching the verse in Revelation from a doctrinal sense, we can look at this church as a church in the tribulation. They need to work and labor without fainting. Even though Christians aren't saved by works, these tribulation saints will be under a faith and works set up. You will see a theme in the general epistles in Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. You'll see a theme that is different from the Pauline epistles. The general epistles seem to hint at, the, at some type of works being required. And the reason for that is, in the tribulation, you have the mark of the beast. And they're going to have to abstain from taking the mark. We don't have that in the church age. And that's what makes it so different. The guys that try to get rid of the works in the tribulation don't know what to do with that mark of the beast. And that's what makes it so difficult. James 2.21 through 24 says this was not abraham our father justified by works when he had offered isaac his son upon the altar seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which saith abraham believed god and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of god 
You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So James uses Abraham as, a, as an example for the need of works. James, if you look at the beginning of the book of James, it says it was written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad showing it will apply to Jewish saints in the tribulation time period. Abraham's salvation isn't necessarily like the salvation of a son in the tribulation, and it isn't exactly like our salvation. Abraham was saved by faith when he believed what God said about his seed in Genesis 15:6. But as James says, he wasn't justified until he offered Isaac his son on the altar. His faith was made perfect. When he offered his son. This is completely different than our faith. Because our faith doesn't need perfecting. Our faith is already perfect. The moment we believe. Because our faith is in a perfect person. The Lord Jesus Christ. Many believe James 2. 20 through 24. Is only referring to justification. In the eyes of men. But when Abraham offered Isaac. There wasn't any men around. So it had to refer to justification. In the eyes of God. When tribulation saints read the book of James, they will see an element of works is involved. And it's involved for them in that future time. A lot of people today will go to James chapter 4, or James chapter 2, 20 through 24, and say, hey, a Christian can lose their salvation. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We can apply James 2, 20 through 24 to ourselves in a doctrinal sense because Christians in the age we are in cannot lose salvation. The Bible says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't get separated from Jesus Christ's body if we don't have works. We should have works, but that's not what keeps us saved. But in the coming tribulation time period, there's going to be an element of works involved. And you can't get around it because of that mark of the beast. These guys will try to get rid of that mark of the beast by saying there's going to be uh, brain scanners to scan your brain. And if you're a Christian, then they, the Antichrist won't give you the mark. They'll say that God will just keep every Christian or saint from taking the mark, which the Bible doesn't say that. And does God really work that way? Does he force people into not doing something? Doesn't he want them to believe, believe on him and choose him by their own free will and not just make them take it, not take it? I've heard a lot of excuses that just don't really, it does, it's, not in, it's not in the Bible. But Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in the tribulation, it's a faith and works set up. they got to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They're going to... Keep the commandments. Uh, Exodus 20 and verse 4 says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And if the saints in tribulation bow down and worship the beast in his image, then they are doomed, even if they had faith. And to, not, to deny this is to deny the Bible. Look at Revelation 14, 9 through 10. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So there's no denying if you take that mark, worship the beast in his image, you're damned for hell and there's no way back. And I don't see any way around this. I wish I could find a way around that. And if you if you know something, then 
explain it to me. But if a saint takes the mark of the beast, he loses his salvation and goes to hell. How can we deny these plain verses in Revelation 14? I have heard people try to deny this without changing the text. And I told you the reasons they said earlier about they're going to have brain scanning technology and they'll be able to tell who's a Christian. And they'll just automatically put the Christians to death. And I've seen some people even outright deny the verses and say that saints in the tribulation can still take the mark and still be saved because they have eternal security. But the verse has said they're going to go to hell for doing it. For me to apply once saved, always saved to the tribulation, seeing these plain verses is a real stretch. Even though you're going to get a whole bunch of hate for denying eternal security in the Bible, I feel like I gotta deny what these people are saying or deny the Bible. I'm gonna just gonna deny the people because I don't want to deny what the Bible says. In this age we are in now, God hasn't set up any conditions for being saved. All we have to do to be saved is believe the gospel. There isn't something we have to abstain from to keep our salvation. The tribulation and saints, on the other hand, they're gonna have to believe the gospel, but they're also gonna have to abstain from taking the mark. The only way out of this is to outright deny the text, change the text, add something to the text, or come up with assumptions like God will keep the saints from taking the mark, or there's going to be brain scanners or some other technology so they know that you're a Christian and won't even give you the mark. They'll just behead you, which saying that God will keep every saint from taking the mark goes against our free will. And he wants us to choose him over Satan willingly. Many men today from the Church of God, Holiness, Churches, Pentecostal, Methodist, and others will go to books like Hebrews to prove we can presently lose our salvation. Which can't be true because Paul plainly teaches we have eternal security. The reason they do this is because there are verses that say we can lose our salvation. The thing is, these verses don't apply to us doctrinally but rather to someone in the tribulation. For instance, if you read Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, it says, For it is impossible. Notice that verse, impossible. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. And now look at this. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. A partaker of the Holy Ghost. And ha have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, it's a, notice, remember that word impossible, it says if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So it's impossible to renew them again into repentance if they fall away. Notice the Bible says we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. This proves the person had to have been saved. It says if they fall away, it is impossible, as it says in verse 4, to renew them again into repentance. There is only one thing in Scripture that I know of that will automatically damn someone in the coming tribulation to where they can never be saved again. And that is taking the mark of the beast. That is the unpardonable sin of the tribulation. That is another thing different from the time we are presently in because right now there is no unpardonable sin. The only thing that will send a man to hell right now is dying without Jesus Christ. Dying in unbelief. Dying without putting your trust in the gospel. See, these tribulation saints are going to have to work and labor without feigning. They're going to have to make it to the end of the time of Jacob's trouble with not just the faith of Jesus Christ, but also without taking the mark of the beast. The only other option for them would be to die as a martyr. They can take Jesus literally when he says this in Matthew 5.30. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish. And not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It would be better to literally cut off your right hand than to get the mark of the beast in your right hand. And it would be better to get your head chopped off and die as a martyr than to get the mark in your forehead. So they will have to die as a martyr 
or make it to the end of the tribulation without taking the mark and also have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 2, 2 and 3 says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Not only are they a church who work and labor without feigning, but they are also a church with patience. Right now we are supposed to be patiently waiting for Jesus Christ to get us at the rapture before the tribulation. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. While these guys in the tribulation, they're going to be have to be patiently waiting for Jesus Christ together then together at the second coming. We aren't looking for the Antichrist, but rather Jesus Christ. In the tribulation, they're going to be patiently waiting for Jesus Christ to gather them together, as it talks about in Matthew 24, 31. And it says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather, gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And notice the Bible says in Matthew 24 that this was Im immediately after the tribulation of those days. So this isn't referring to a pre-tribulation rapture, as many people believe. If it says, after the tribulation of those days, then it's referring to a time that's sometime in the tribulation. Matthew 24, 31 is definitely a rapture, a rapture-like event for the tribulation saints. Call it whatever you want, but here it calls it a gathering. They're going to have to patiently wait for this. Patience is a great thing in any age. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Revelation 2.2 2 and 3 Next we see that they aren't just a church that works and labors without feigning, or only a church with patience, but they are also an intolerant church. They can't bear them which are evil, as the verse says. It says, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. When I got saved, I step away, stepped away from all the worldly things I was involved in. I quit watching the wicked movies, listening to wicked music, and participating in sinful activities. I tried my best to. When I happened to see bad things on television at a friend's or family's house or in the store, I thought to myself about how bad it has gotten since I had gotten saved. But really, it had always been bad and I had just become intolerant after I had gotten saved and gotten away from the world and got into the Bible. But Psalms 97.10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Uh, Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy in the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Even the music and things of this world that our flesh likes, something inside, inside us says, I hate it. When you get saved, get in the King James Bible, separate yourself from the world and get exposed to real Bible preaching, you become intolerant really fast. You will be ruined when it comes to enjoying the pleasures of this world. Uh, Revelation 2, 2, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Next we see that this church was a church that could spot a fake. Can you spot a fake, or do you know the Bible enough to spot when somebody's teaching you something wrong? This church, uh, historically, probably represents the time in church history that saw the real apostles with the real apostolic signs. So they could spot a fake apostle. Today's Christians should be able to read the Bible and spot a fake like Benny Hinn, who claims to be a faith healer. But he is what Paul calls a false apostle in 2 Corinthians 11.13. The Bible says the Jews require a sign, and the sign gift ceased when God quit dealing with the Jew and switched over to the Gentile. The Jews can still be saved. They have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. No Jew that is a Christ rejecter is going to go to heaven. He's going to go to hell. For some reason, all the non-dispensationalists 
think that dispensationalists believe all Jews are going to go to heaven even if they deny Jesus Christ, which is not true. They have to get saved just like anybody else. So the Jews can still get saved, but as a nation they are blinded concerning the gospel, as it talks about in Romans 11:25. But we should study the Bible enough to know a false prophet or faith, fake faith healer when he shows up. So this church has a lot of good things written about them, but they also have a downfall. Their downfall is in Revelation 2.4. It says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. 1 John 4.19 says, We love him because he first loved us. In case you have left your first love, remember what Jesus did for you. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, John fifteen thirteen. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now John lays out what we should do to get back to how we used to be. In Revelation 2, 5 it says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. We need to remember, repent, and repeat. Remember what it was like when you first got saved. And how you love to read the Bible. How you love to fellowship with Jesus Christ. And how the Bible was alive to you when you opened it. This verse is one of those places where repent would mean turn from sin. Repentance at salvation means to turn from your own self-righteousness. And turn to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You don't quit certain sins to get saved. That's impossible. But after you're saved, repentance means turn from sin. I'm saved, so if I get off into sin, I'm going to repent. I'm going to confess those sins and repent and turn from those sins. Not to be saved, not to stay saved, but to stay in fellowship. But to get back to our first love, we need to do the things you, we did when we first got saved. Read the Bible as much as you used to. Pray as much as you used to. And, the, and enjoy the things of God like you used to. This may not be easy right off, but you have to work at it. Just like some people, when they first get saved, they don't ever get to read the Bible. They don't ever start praying. They never grow and they act like a worldly Christian. Maybe you've never even got to the point where you even had a first love. You have to get in the Bible and read it and pray and get sin out of your life to have fellowship with Jesus Christ even after you're saved. Here's the consequence if this church does it, remember, repent, and repeat. Revelation 2.5, it says, Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. The candlestick is referring to the church of Ephesus, and not to the individual. Jesus Christ is saying he is coming quickly, and if they don't do something fast, he is going to be here before they get right. He ends with another commendation. In Revelation 2.6, it says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So this is a church that hates what God hates. Many people think that God only loves, but someone who only loves doesn't truly love anybody. You have to hate some things to love people. Can a man love rape, crime, murder, fornication, and other sins, and still love the victims of those sins? God hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And Nicolaitans just means clergy over the laity. Meaning a high up religious big shot is over, over the common people. Pretending to be more spiritual and a higher power than the common people. He will teach you to have to come to him to know what the Bible says and he is a liar. All you need to know what the Bible says is a Bible and the Holy Spirit. God's attitude of a Nicolaitan is that he can't stand them. He hates them. And watch out for Nicolaitan preachers and teachers who make you think you have to come to them to know the Bible because they know Greek. But God hates their deeds. And here are some other things he hates. It says in Proverbs six sixteen through 19, it says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, 
Feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. God hates some things, but true love hates. A Revelation 2, 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And Revelation 2, 7, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If they overcome, then the reward reward is that they can eat of the tree of life. This goes completely different than our eternal salvation. When we get saved, we are saved permanently the moment we believe, and we don't have to eat off of a tree to get eternal life. We will have glorified bodies that we live forever. Many good men in the past have been so baffled by this verse that they want rid of it. One famous Baptist preacher said he wanted rid of the verse because it didn't fit Baptist doctrine. But the King James Bible is perfect. We don't remove verses because it doesn't fit Baptist doctrine. We just correct the Baptist doctrine with the Bible. There are obviously no errors in Scripture. If Paul says we have eternal life, then we know we aren't the people referred to in Revelation 2-7 who need to eat off of a tree because we already have eternal life. We don't need to get eternal life off of, off of a tree. There are going to be people from the tribulation who go into the millennial kingdom without glorified bodies. These people with natural bodies will continue to bear children all the way out into eternity. And these will be those who eat off the tree of life to live forever. At Revelation 22 and verse 2 says, In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of of the nations. This is why God had cherubims guard the Garden of Eden after the fall. He knew Adam and Eve would get in there and eat off the tree. And look what it says would happen if they did. In Genesis 3.22, they would live forever, as it says at the end of the verse. But if you want to be saved and have eternal life right now, the way to do that is to believe the gospel. And you can find the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So this is the gospel. Jesus Christ died, he died for you, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. He had to die for you because you're a sinner. In Romans 3.23 it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous, no not one. The Bible says we can't be saved by our works, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So we're not saved by our works. We're not kept saved by our works. We don't quit sinning to be saved. We're saved by placing our faith in the gospel. When you place your faith in the gospel, God takes your unrighteousness, throws it into the sea, it's forgotten and gone, and gives you Jesus Christ's perfect, sinless, righteous record. That's called imputed righteousness. And that's why you get to go to heaven. Because when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ and doesn't see your sin. But if you want to be saved, believe the gospel. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.